Hi, my name's Jim Dowdle. I'm a movie stuntman and I'm here in this extraordinary boys' playground of the Tank Museum at Bombington, which is a real privilege. Um, I've appeared in, luckily, many, many movies, uh, lots of war movies. I was shot in Where Eagles Dare by Clint Eastwood and uh, uh, I drove the tank in, in uh, Goldeneye and I worked on Private Ryan and sort of Bridge Too Far and The Eagle Has Landed and all that. And you never see us as stunt guys. Uh, but I've been privileged to come here and talk to you about some of the armoured vehicles and one not so armoured vehicle, which are my favourites. Uh, and it's really, really interesting to be surrounded by all this stuff. I had no idea there was this much armour under one roof. Okay, here's our first tank. This is the Sherman Achilles which is the British version of the American M10, so-called tank destroyer with a 17-pounder gun, which is a really, really efficient anti-tank weapon. When I had one of these, that was kind of my introduction to armour. I'd first seen Sherman tanks on a film that I'd worked on called The Dirty Dozen many moons ago when God was a corporal, and uh, I thought, yeah, that's a really beautiful looking piece of kit. And I yenned to own one. And then I worked on other films and, and we had Shermans on them and I thought, shall I, shan't I, shall I, shan't I. Eventually I, I scraped up enough money and I was going to buy a standard Sherman, but instead what came up was an Achilles, which had been built by, uh, restored by a company down in the West Country uh, who'd had guys in the winter, they did bulldozers and diggers and all that kind of stuff, and in the winter when the mud was too bad, they had nothing to do. So they rebuilt this Achilles, and I bought it as a rebuilt vehicle. Had enormous amount of fun with it, couldn't believe how much money I was spending on petrol to keep it running. Uh, couldn't believe how much I was having to replace batteries and things. But then I was one guy maintaining a vehicle which normally has a crew of five, and those guys are all running around tightening up tracks and changing the oils and checking everything and all that kind of, and I was just one guy. Great fun. A dim view was taken by the local farmer where I live uh, when I did take it out in even remotely uh, wet weather where it would churn things up. But I had great fun. It was the ultimate boy's toy. If you can't afford a Spitfire, this is the next best thing. Right, this is the Stug, Sturmgeschutz, assault gun, as it was known in the German army. Many thousands of these produced, and it was kind of the backbone of the German army. Many different marks, smaller gun, larger gun, etc., etc., etc. For me, this is the German tank, in a way, the workhorse of the German army. A lot of people would say the, the Panzer IV, but for me, the Stug is a very, very cleverly designed weapon, and I Loved the look of them right from page one when I used to see them in the, the Victor comic and when I was a kid. They would have pictures of Stugs because the illustrators in those days were ex-military guys and they could actually really draw stuff accurately. <clears throat> Much lower profile here than a normal tank, although you haven't got a revolving turret on this, that's what allows it to be a lot lower. This here, quite interesting, this. This is called a Saukopf or a pig's head mantlet. And I think the shape of it is self-explanatory, a boar's head, okay? And the idea is there that, that, that small arms rounds and even you know, light anti-tank rounds will bounce off this. I mean, it's a peculiar casting, but it gives it a very, very distinctive shape. Here on the front is this lovely stuff called Zimmerit, which is anti-magnetic paste. Now, this was made up to a specific formula which included petrol. The idea is that if, um, uh, particularly in Russia, uh, the, the Russian guys had these magnetic bombs which they could smack onto something metal, pull the pin, run away, and it would actually blow a hole in the tank. So the Germans started to put everything uh, armoured, covered in this stuff called Zimmerit. So this is called waffle pattern. Zimmerit. We're now getting into real... Okay, there are different types of Zimmerit. On some of them you'll see lines which are done with a kind of a, a fork arrangement, but this was known as a waffle pattern Zimmerit. Um, 
and it's the paste that it's made out of contains petrol, which means that when it was put on for a few days uh, until it went off completely, if it was struck by an incendiary round, the Zimrit would start to burn, which was a little bit um, undignified. Uh, but it worked to a certain extent, uh, and they kept on painting everything with Zimrit to the end of the war, even though the, the anti-magnetic um, bombs were almost finished by then. It was just a German habit. They, they put it on. Here on the side, this was not for the benefit of the crew's barbecue and for them to sit around on. This was actually extra armour protection because in, in many campaigns they were meeting better and better anti-tank weapons. Uh, the crews would then put anything on the side which might explode an anti-tank round before it actually punched its way through the armour. Um, good solid steel tracks. These, uh, this particular vehicle is an ex-Finnish army one. The Finns uh, were uh, supplied with quite a lot of Stugs by the Germans and this is one of those. Um, and this was restored by a pal of mine, Mike Gibb, who also restored one into, into extraordinarily beautiful condition, which was actually at the bottom of the Black Sea. It was on a, on a ship that was torpedoed in the Black Sea on the way to the Crimea. It was brought up from under the sea uh, in the late 90s. Mike brought it and completely and utterly restored it from top to bottom so that it's now absolutely immaculate vehicle. I first saw a real Stug, funnily enough, an ex-Finnish Stug, on a film called The Eagle Has Landed. And we were out in Finland doing a sequence which was supposed to be on the Russian front. And we had a train in the back which was supposed to be on its way to the front. And there's a little incident there with Michael Caine and blah, 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 blah. And all I wanted to do was to go over and look at this Stug, you know, and stroke it. And it was a real Stug. And Michael Caine said to me, you're not well, are you? I went, oh, OK, well, it's, and that's when I realised that most people actually don't give a hoot about this kind of stuff, you know, but I was, oh, Stug, so exciting. Um, this one, being an ex-Finnish one, has got various bits and pieces which the German one might not have had. It's got, it's got, you would have, it's got different bits and pieces on the back, particularly the lights. But again, an extremely, extremely rare vehicle, interesting, backbone of the German, and why I like the Stug. So now we come to a real old favourite. Not so old when I first met it. This is the Russian T-55, which was originally their main battle tank. And I was introduced to this tank for the film GoldenEye, where the idea was that we were going to be doing a chase, the like of which nobody had ever done before on film. And because it was a Bond film, and because it was Pierce Brosnan's first depiction of Bond, they were going to throw something special. So this is where we started, and I'm going to tell you some stories about the T-55, which is a big old big old chunk of steel and it's not something which is like a movie prop which people think that it's fiberglass and it's not going to harm you. This was the real thing. In, so, so in 1996 this was home for about three months down there. We had three of these on GoldenEye and uh, in order to run them in St Petersburg where we shot one of the sequences uh, the Russian authorities had said to us you cannot run steel tracks. They do not run a rubber track for the T-55. So we got the idea that by cutting out a new sprocket, we could actually use chieftain track, which is what we eventually worked out as being the best type of track for the job because that has rubber grousers on it, which are also replaceable. The problem is they're that much too wide. So I had to spend a whole day with a gas axe cutting off the inside horns of the track so that when you put it on the sprocket, it didn't actually get caught up in the bodywork of the tank. So that was a good week's work. So now we've got to have Pierce Brosnan seemingly driving the tank and Pierce doesn't drive tanks and he's not allowed to drive tanks because Pierce is worth too much money. 
Now, you can spot the deliberate mistake here. The tank is driven from the left, and what we see is Pierce driving from the right. So what we had to do was to cut a secondary hatch there and put a seat in there and everything else, and that's why uh, we as the driver could not be seen under any circumstances uh, on film. So we were always hatched down, and Pierce is there giving it large with a, 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 with a, a dummy uh, lid on, on the slot which was made of, of uh, fiberglass, which, which you could pick up with one hand. Of course, it needs two of you virtually to lift the real thing. Um, and that's the thing that always says, I, did, I thought tanks always drove from the left, or Russian tanks, and they do. They either drive from the center or from the left. But, you know, we live in a different world in the film business. So now we've worked out that we're gonna have tracks with rubber grouses on them so that they don't screw up the road. Uh, and now we've got to cut a second hatch here so that Pierce can be seen to be driving the vehicle. And originally, I'd worked out that by putting a small digital camera, and remember this is 20 years ago now, and they were not sophisticated in any way in the same way that they are now. I put a digital camera underneath the barrel here, and I put one in a little small pod that we built on either side of the tank, and inside, uh, in the driver's compartment, I had three small video screens. So at least I could see where the outside of the vehicle was and where the center of the vehicle was. The problem was that with a wide angle lens, which is what I needed, somebody who was standing eight or nine feet in front of the tank looked like they were 35 or 40 feet away, which can be marginally dangerous if you haven't taken that into account and you're rolling down the road at 25 miles an hour. And eventually I, I felt that it was too dangerous, so I felt we needed to have a three dimensional image. So I cut a piece of the armor out directly in my eye line. That took me a whole day. The armor was this thick, and I took about four or five bottles of, of acetylene with a gas ax to cut that piece out. And then we put a, a moody uh, headlight and some scrim and bits and pieces over it so you wouldn't know. But essentially, that was my, my way of, of viewing to see where I was going. <clears throat> Having put the Chieftain track on, we had very thick rubber grouses and we needed to get that rubber worn right down so that we could start to slide the tank. This tank has a two-speed axle and <clears throat> on the tillers, when you move off, you then push the tillers forward, they clunk into another gear and it puts the back axle into a second gear so that when you pull back on one tiller to turn, <clears throat> is effectively reducing the drive on one side of the vehicle. So you're not using a track brake at all, which is how we managed to get the, the vehicle to slide with the addition of lots of fairy liquid in buckets uh, mixed with water and then thrown on the ground to the area where we wanted the tank to slide. So there was lots of bits and pieces to happen before we could actually even think about filming. So now we've got, the we've got the visibility sorted out, we've got the track sorted out, and we've got the sliding sorted out. And Gary Powell uh, and myself uh, are now working on getting the refinements of being able to put this exactly where we want it. Gary was fantastic. He'd never driven a tank before. I taught him how to drive the tank, and he was off. Absolutely superb. <coughs> we did have one minor accident when <coughs> Gary was driving, and he managed to drive over the camera because the grip didn't get it out of the way fast enough. And that was about 200,000 pounds worth. And the largest piece that we recovered from underneath the tracks was like that. But, you know, that's filmmaking. So we start our filming in St. Petersburg. And one of the areas that we were shooting alongside the river was just one place they said you cannot run a fully loaded T-55 there. So we had to build a dummy T-55 on a Saladin six-wheeled armoured car, British six-wheeled armoured car chassis and put tracks on it which moved because the vehicle had rubber wheels uh, uh, and tyres on it uh, and, it and it didn't have the weight. So that really was built at huge expense. I mean, huge cost to get the tracks to move on it and everything else for one shot which was running 
alongside the river when you see the Russian jeeps backing up, firing AKs at bombs, and he's chasing them. That was purely built for that one shot. Um, <laughs> we had uh, allocated to us out there two Russian tank mechanics who were national service guys but knew the T-55. These boys were 19 years old and they were being paid a dollar a month, one dollar a month. And they arrive on this film set and there's all these huge vehicles and, and uh, just another world to them. But they used to get in the tank in the morning and in the T-55 you have a little donkey engine which you have to start up in the morning in order to, particularly if you're in, in Arctic weather, you start the donkey engine and that warms the oil up enough so that you then pull the starter on the main engine and the, water, the oil is already warmed up. This is a, an absolute must in Russian military terms. You are uh, completely sacked and put up against a wall and whatever if you start that tank from cold without actually warming the oil. So we would get onto the set at six o'clock in the morning and I'd look underneath the tank and you could see a little, a little jet of flame coming, which was the donkey engine. And those boys had been in there at half past five and they would start the donkey engine so that all I had to do was to get in there and start the main engine and away we go. But if they were slightly late and the temperature wasn't up, they would stand there and physically stop me from getting in the, in the turret. And when they were going to adjust the track brakes, they would open the hatch at the back and the track brakes are adjusted with a, an adjustable spanner. And they're literally just two bands which clamp onto the drive shaft at the back. And as a, as a feeler gauge, they used a match. So one guy would put the match in and then he would shout to his mate in the front because the adjusters are in the front there and his mate would span her in until he said, whoa, that's it. And those brakes worked fantastically while we were in St. Petersburg. We never got them to the same level of adjustment when we came back to UK. So now we're, we're uh, in the tank and we're roaring around the set and Pierce is in here. Uh, you know, because he took the handsome lessons and they worked in spades. So he's doing his thing there and this is the, it's Pierce's first Bond film and it's a really, really good and exciting sequence, but that's all he's got to do. And meanwhile, Gary or myself are down here sweating buckets, making sure that we don't actually run over a crew member or a camera. But luckily I wasn't driving when that happened. So we filmed for about four weeks the tank chase. The tanks that we bought came, one of them came from Israel and still had live rounds and, and sand in the bottom of the turret bustle. Uh, one was virtually brand new and had all the equipment in it, including the handbooks, it had the snorkel, the night vision gear, everything. It was absolutely, I don't know, I can't remember where it came from. And the, and the third one was an absolute dog and the clutch was always slipping and it was a thing. But between them, we put chieftain track on all three of them so that we could swap the, the tanks around and they got the job done and the clutch went on the second one on the very last day of filming so we just got in there by the, by the skin of our teeth really. Um, the whole experience was for me it was just you know I was getting paid for having fun but there was also uh, 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 an element that when you're playing with a toy of this size and there's a lot of people on a film set, even experienced film technicians who think, well, everybody knows what they're doing. I can walk up to this with impunity. And it was a real lesson for me that, that, that people do not appreciate that your visibility there is limited. Without that, your visibility is limited to a letterbox. So that I carried this forward when we did Fury and I had five Shermans with a lot of infantry and things around and we actually built in a cutout into each of those. And I had the sort of master switch hanging around my neck. And if I pushed the button, I could kill all those engines simply because people get blasé and they forget that the, num the amount of tons here is you don't come back for a second dose. That's it, it's finished. So that's the T-55, it has great memories. We had a fantastic time. It was Pierce's first Bond film and we were all really, really enjoying trying to give him a, 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 
reputational stamp which was very different from where Roger Moore had been because Roger had always played it much more comedically and uh, 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 Pierce wanted to bring Bond back far more in the, in the Sean Connery mould and start to, to really give him some grit. So uh, at, the end, at the end of the film, I think it worked. So this is one of my favourite vehicles, although it is not armoured. I have one of these and I've had one for many years and it's called a Kettenkrad, which means literally tracked motorcycle. The Germans built about seven and a half thousand of these, extremely expensive to produce, uh, rather complex, had a very standard car engine in them, which is the only easy thing, the Opel Olympia engine, which was built from about 1938 to 1956, so engine parts aren't a problem, but everything else is, is one-offs. Uh, the tracks have rubber track pads on them, which makes them very, very quiet. Tactically, it's a brilliant vehicle from that point of view, but there's a, you know, a differential and track brakes and all sorts of things here to go wrong with it. And in minus 30 with a Russian shooting at you, are you going to be looking after the maintenance? Possibly not. Um, they were specifically built to tow light artillery pieces into places where normally mules might get or and particularly into aircraft the Junker 52 didn't have a, a, a loading uh, a capacity for any kind of large vehicle but with these they could tow light artillery pieces up and then break and go down inside the aircraft very clever piece of kit but monstrously expensive I first uh, drove one of these on a film called Where Eagles Dare in 1960 <laughs> when we were out in Austria uh, making that film and I absolutely fell in love with it. I thought it was just the most brilliant, brilliant machine. But, uh, you know, a lot of money and I managed to finally buy one about uh, 22, 23 years ago and uh, I've done a certain amount of work to it. But they're great fun. They will go almost anywhere except that they're, if you, because they do 40 miles an hour, if you go hard into a left-hand bend and start the, the track braking, you can actually lift the tracks up and you will notice in Saving Private Ryan there's a sequence where they, two of the American paratroopers disappear off as bait for the Germans in the end sequence there. And you see them going around the corner and you see it actually lifting up off, uh, off one track. And that was quite, quite a lot of them were overturned at the time. So in terms of the controls here, in typical German thorough fashion, you've got this beautiful piece of kit here to stop you being splashed with mud from the front wheel. Perish the thought if you're on the eastern front and you get covered in mud. Okay, you've got a three-speed gearbox here and a gate here and then you push that forward, that's reverse. That's just to stop you accidentally selecting reverse. You've got a high and low gear ratio, so you've effectively got six gears. And then when you're turning, you, as I said, you can go 10% to just change direction. And then when you actually go around slightly harder down here, you bring in a track brake. So depending on how much pressure you put on the handlebars is how tight the turn goes. And there's a differential in there to sort out the power to each wheels. You've got a foot brake down there like a normal car and a normal clutch pedal here. And uh, you've got a hand throttle so you can set it at certain levels and, and away you go. You can actually climb out of it and just watch it going across the field. It's very funny. The clever thing here is that the petrol tanks have got one pickup here. These are the two, two fuel tanks. One pickup is at the back here, and one pickup is at the front. So if you haven't got much fuel in it, and you're going up a slope like that, and all the fuel goes to the back of this tank, you'll still get fuel to the, to the carburetor. And likewise, if you're going in a down slope, it'll pick up on this one, so that you know that whatever happens, if you've got a, a couple of pints of fuel in each fuel tank, you're gonna get the best out of it. And in fact, the front wheels in, in the really muddy conditions used to get so clogged up that you will see pictures of them where they've taken, they've literally cut the fork off with, a, with an arc and, and just taken the whole front section out and they're just driving it on the tracks. Very go anywhere machine. And they also fitted what they called snow grousers, which brought the tracks out much wider here so that they wouldn't sink in. Um, two guys go on the back, driver in the front. He could sometimes put a tonneau cover and there's a heater. I mean, this is only the Germans would think of this there's heater ductings that come from the engine into this compartment. So if the guy's got the tonneau wrapped around him, he's got lots of hot air around his legs and around the family allowance and everything to keep the bottom half warm. And then they would have 
uh, like these mittens that came over the hand. So when you put your hands inside there, again, you were, your hands were kept a lot warmer than if you were exposed to the elements. Very complex machine to maintain. And uh, they stopped building after 7,500, probably for good reason, that they realized that they were going to have to go somewhere simpler. Great fun. I occasionally take my dogs for a walk with these. And like I say, when you're doing 40 miles an hour, it's really fantastic. They're beautiful, beautiful things. And you really can't hear them. At, at 30 miles an hour, going down a, a, a tarmac road on this, with a, with a, you know, if your silence is in good nick, superb, absolutely fantastic piece of kit. I love these because they're worth a lot of money. It's my pension, really. When I'm too old to climb into it, I'll sell it and um, buy something less sensible. But as long as I can get into it, I have fun with it. It's a great, great piece of kit, the Kettenkrad tracked motorcycle. So this is the Panther. This for me is the ultimate German tank. People talk about Tigers and Tiger Royal and all that kind of stuff. To me, the Tiger is an enormous great brick outhouse with a flat front, which invites armor piercing shells to go through it. Okay, this was what was brought out directly to counter the T-34. When the, the T-34 appeared on the battlefield with its sloped armor, the Panther came out and it really did the business. Smaller gun than the, than the Tiger one, 75 millimeter as opposed to an 88 millimeter, but a high velocity gun match anything that the Russians had. This tank doesn't have Zimmerit on it because it was assembled after the war in British Army workshops, but it does have this piece, which is called Schürzen, which is the German for skirts. And these were bolted on the sides or hung on the sides, in fact, so you could take them off as uh, it, it, if you fired an anti-tank round at it, a hollow charge. The idea was that it would, hit the, it would hit the skirts and explode before it got to the main part of the tank. When you see one of these on the, on the move, with that, that uh, torsion bar suspension. And there's, a, there's a, a thing on YouTube where you can actually see one of these really on the trot. It's absolutely poetry in motion, watching the, 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 uh, you know, how they took the bumps out on this. It was an extremely comfortable ride, I'm told, in this tank. Now, if you move towards the front, you can begin to see, A, the thickness of that armor here. And then as you move around to the front, we begin to see the slope of the armor, totally different from anything that the Germans have produced before with their flat fronts, whether it was a Panzer IV, Panzer III, Tiger, this was the one. So you've got sloped armor that way and sloped armor underneath to, to, to ricochet anything down onto the ground. They actually thought about the crew of this tank. So if it was hit and disabled, instead of having to climb out of the turret, exposing themselves to all the kind of small arms fire that was, providing the turret was turned towards the enemy, there's a big escape hatch that they can get out of, roll onto the back deck and get out of the vehicle. No other, no other vehicle had that, that, uh, that particular escape method and they thought about it. Now, big tank, big piece of kit. Did the job, so they said, right, we're gonna make a slightly cheaper version of an assault gun, which is the Jagd Panther, which is the hunting panther, which has the same chassis and engine and everything else there, but it doesn't have a turret. So it's got a fixed gun with about five degrees left and right on that gun, which had then an 88 millimeter rather than the 75. Uh, beautiful tank. Uh, and the particular one that is uh, around at the moment, which is going the rounds is completely restored and in running condition was found on a range full of holes uh, with nothing in it and a guy called Mike Gibb restored it and it is now appearing on the circuit and you will have maybe seen it at tank fest or various things. But this for me is the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate German tank of World War II. There is nothing quite like it where it's been thought about to the extent of it's not about bulk, it's not about the thickness of the armour, it's about speed, getting it tactically into where they need it in battle and a high enough velocity gun to cope with anything that the Russians could put in the field. I've never driven one of these. I'd love to, but I love the look of them. Aesthetically, it's a, it's a, it's a prime, ultimate killing machine that looks the business.
So we've now run through my favourite armoured vehicles, except for the Cat Crab, which of course which isn't armoured, but I still love it, and it's here in the museum. And the museum is the most extraordinary collection. <laughs> Every time I come here, I see something new. But if you want to have a look more, do have a look at the YouTube channel for the, for the museum or support us on Patreon and come to the museum. It's a, <laughs> it's a phenomenal collection. I never, I never get bored coming here. There's always something new to see.